Dear Father, we thank you that you are renewing everything and you are transforming everything that our hands touch and you are going to create for yourself a harmonious community that is a picture to the world of heaven here on earth. And we trust you to continue it in each one of us for your glory. Amen. It really is amazing that we're all here alive today. You know, it is really. Um, and you may say, oh, why? Uh, why is it amazing that we're alive? <laughs> well, really, really because by rights we should all be dead. We really should. We should all be absolutely wiped out. No. That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened, oh, maybe four or five thousand years ago. That's exactly what happened. The creator looked down, and the whole thing was much as it is today. And he just decided, I'll just wipe it out, you know, and start all over again. And you remember this in Genesis 6, if you like to look at it. Genesis 6, and it's about page 5. Yeah, page 5, Genesis 6, and it was the same situation, dear ones, as we have today, really. Genesis 6 and 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the ground, Man and beast and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. And he carried it out, you know, it's recorded there in 7, chapter 7, 21, 23. Next chapter, in verse 21. And all flesh died as a result of a flood, you remember, that moved upon the earth. Birds, cattle, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm upon the earth. And every man, everything on the dry land and whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the ground. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the air, they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those that were with him in the ark. And the reason God got rid of everything was because, really, they refused to treat him as their creator. They refused to treat him as a loving creator who was in control of everything. And they refused to receive the miraculous life power that he offered them. And so God was a holy and just God, and he had to destroy it before they spread that same kind of spirit throughout the world and throughout his universe. And so God just wiped us all out. And brothers and sisters, we're in the same situation today, really. I mean, many of us don't treat God as our creator at all. You know that. Otherwise, why do we worry so much about jobs, about the future in our jobs, and about our marital status? You know that. It would be really hard to go around you sisters, and the, better do it with the brothers as well, around you sisters and brothers, without you know, finding somewhere in the back of your mind a fair little bit of worry or anxiety about when am I going to get married, whom am I going to marry, when am I going to get a job that I really enjoy? And really, that worry and anxiety is because basically we don't trust God can handle the situation. Or we don't trust that he will handle it the way we want him to handle it. That he won't pick the kind of girl or the kind of fella that we want to pick. But basically, loved ones, it's an attitude to God that is kind of the same as took place four or five thousand years ago. We refuse to treat God as our creator. And you know, it goes into all sorts of things. It's the reason why we live so much in the future. You know that. Because we don't really trust that God can take care of the future. In fact, we're not quite sure that he has it organized for us. Or that he has any purpose or plan in having us here at all. That's why most Christians, as well as most humanists, live a third of the time in the past in regrets, a third of the time in the future in worries, and part of the next third they live in the present. But really, we only live about a third of our lives here in the present. And the basic reason is, we don't treat God as our creator. And as a loving father, 
who has all that organized. And so we don't simply take care of our end of it today and trust him to take care of it tomorrow. And you see, that's the same kind of attitude that meant that God had to destroy the world and all the people in it four or five thousand years ago. Because as a result of that attitude, we all become expert manipulators. You know that. We manipulate. We manipulate people. We manipulate circumstances. We regard ourselves as gods of our own lives and gods of our futures. And our job is to try to ensure that it goes the way we want it to. In spite of the fact that we can ensure nothing. We spend most of our lives trying to be gods and control things and make them go the way we want them to go. Now that's exactly the same reason brothers and sisters, that made it necessary for our Creator to destroy everybody four or five thousand years ago. The reason is plain. If you have a lot of gods, if you have three and a half billion gods, and there are three and a half billion of us, if there are, you have three and a half billion gods all trying to run their own lives in the way that pleases them, you're bound to have one or two collisions. No. <laughs> you're going to have a couple of billion collisions. And if you let that continue for long enough, they'll eventually tear themselves apart. And that's why God had to come down and just destroy the whole thing the last time. Now, why did he not do it this time? Because he found a way of giving us a second chance to receive this miraculous life power that he had offered us originally. And yet remain a just and a holy God. He found a way in which a holy God and a rebellious wild earth and people could live in peaceful coexistence for at least another few years. And his way was this. He allowed his son to be destroyed for us. So that his justice and holiness could never be called in question, it would be obvious that it had reacted against someone. Someone had taken the brunt of the death penalty for us. And so God was able to give us a reprieve for another few years on earth to give us a second chance to receive the life power that he had made available originally. But really that's it. Don't. It is a reprieve. you know. It's just a reprieve. And it's in that sense, you see, that Jesus has died for the whole world. He has died for the whole world in the sense that he has died so that the world could have another few more years of life. Another little opportunity to receive the gift that God had originally offered it. That's why we talk about a universal atonement. We say that Jesus by his death atoned for all your past rejections of God's life and all the sins that stem from those rejections. So in that sense, Jesus paid for or atoned for all the things that should have brought your immediate death. But he could only atone as far as putting off the eventual death. All he could buy for us was a reprieve. Now, that's the meaning of that verse you see in 1 John 2 and verse 2. 1 John 2 and verse 2. It's page 1065. 1065. First John 2 and verse 2. And Jesus, he is the expiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now you see, even the prostitute in Paris that is having intercourse at this moment, Jesus has died for her sins. That's why God does not strike her dead immediately or bring another flood upon the earth. Because Jesus has died for her sins. And she will never be expelled from God's presence because of his condemnation of her. Nor will you or me. Don't. God really has nothing but love towards you and me at this moment. Whatever you've done, whatever you did last night, Whatever you did yesterday, 
God already has received payment for that through his son's death. So he has no reason to condemn you. That is why you're alive here on earth. That's why you're justified in being here on earth. That's why God is justified in allowing you to be on earth and not destroy you immediately. And it's the same with that prostitute. It's the same, you know, with the two fillers that are at this moment emptying an office in New York somewhere. It's the same for them. God actually has nothing but love towards them at this moment. He forgives them utterly because Jesus has died for that sin that they're committing. So in that sense, you see, Jesus has died for the sins of the whole world. In that sense, he has enabled the whole world to continue living at this moment. Now, here is the tragic mistake most of us make. We interpret God's justification for suspending the death penalty, that is, Jesus' death. We interpret God's justification for suspending the death penalty and giving us a reprieve and a respite. We interpret our justification for being alive here still on earth instead of being destroyed by a flood. We interpret that, which is part of justification, as the whole of justification in God's eyes. Now, that's the tragedy. Many of us say, well, brother, I believe what you've said. I believe that Jesus has died for my sins, and that's why I'm alive here today. I believe that God is justified in forgiving me, so therefore I'm a Christian. But brothers and sisters, do you see that that's only half of justification? The only thing that will finally justify us in God's eyes is if we take, oppor take the opportunity that he has offered us in these few years more on earth, if we take advantage of that opportunity to do what he originally asked us to do, receive the life of his Holy Spirit, then we will be fully justified by God. Now, do you see there's a distinction there, loved ones? And it is important, because I think a lot of us, both Christians and humanists alike, mistake God's justification for suspending the death penalty in Jesus' death and our justification for being allowed to remain here on earth for another few years, we mistake that as our justification in God's eyes. It is not. The only thing that will justify us in God's eyes is eventually doing the thing that he originally asked us to do, receive of the tree of life. You remember I shared it with you last Sunday that many of us are like Adam in the Garden of Eden. And we're saying, ah, I'm back in the Garden of Eden. And the tree of life, the Holy Spirit is there. This miraculous life power that will make me like God, it's there. Now I'm back here, I have the opportunity, I'm glad I'm right with you, Lord. And God is saying, you're not right with me until you eat of the tree of life. And we're continually saying, no, no, I'm right if I believe that because of Jesus you have made the tree of life available to me again. I'm right if I believe that because of Jesus' death you have let me into the Garden of Eden again. And God is continually saying, no, my son, no, my daughter. You become right with me when you do what I originally asked you to do because that's the only thing that will make you like my son and like myself. In other words, many of us seem to try to substitute an intellectual assent to the fact that God is justified in allowing us to remain alive for another 70 years, we tend to substitute that assent to that truth for really receiving the life of God's Spirit. And so many of us, dear ones, in church and outside church, are trying to believe away our guilt on the basis of our mental assent to the fact that God is justified in allowing us to live another few years. And we're trying to believe away our guilt, and we can't do it. And we're trying to find real justification. And many of us, I've talked to some of you, and you've listened to some of what we've shared on justification. And then you'll say to me, but, Pastor, I still find myself trying to justify myself. I still find that I'm trying to prove myself by the grade I get, I'm trying to prove myself to my professor. I'm still trying to prove myself to my wife by the way I carry out my job. I'm still trying to prove myself to my parents. I'm still trying to justify myself in my, the eyes of my peers. Loved ones, you do that 
because you haven't entered into real justification. Real justification is not believing that God is justified and forgiving you. Real justification is not in believing that Jesus' death has enabled you to be here alive on earth for another 70 years. Real justification comes when you do what God asked you originally to do, receive the life of his Holy Spirit. Now you see, there's a vast gap there. And loved ones, that unreal justification will never bring a sense of real peace. In other words, there is a universal atonement. You're right. Every prostitute, every thief, every critic among us, every person among us who has been sarcastic, those things have been atoned for by Jesus' death. God will never separate us from himself because of those sins, because they have been paid for by Jesus' death. But do you see, all Jesus' death can do is keep us from being destroyed at this moment. The only thing that will enable us to live forever is if we receive of the tree of that eternal life. In other words, justification includes receiving of the Holy Spirit. And that's really what God wants us to do. Now, it's emphasized, you see, in all the pieces of God's word that talk about justification, this is emphasized. This importance of us actually receiving something into ourselves. Uh, You can see it in Romans 3 and 24 and 26. Romans 3 and 24 to 26. It's page 979. 979. Romans 3 and 24 through 26. They are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as an expiation by his blood, and then here it is, you see, to be received by faith. In other words, you have to receive Jesus' life by faith. You simply haven't to receive the concept that they have stated there by faith. That's only the intellectual belief part of faith. But you've actually to receive the life that has been offered. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies him and then again who has faith in Jesus. And faith in the New Testament means not just a belief that Jesus' death enables us to live for another few more years here on earth, but that Jesus himself is the life, is the tree of life, and that we receive him into ourselves as a spirit of supernatural life that will make us like God. And that really is what God wants us to see plainly. That he can only justify us. You see, it says that God justifies him who has faith in Jesus. God is justified in forgiving us. We are all justified in being alive here on earth. But God can only justify us in his own eyes when we do what he asked us to do. Receive of the tree of life. You get it again in John 1 and 12. Remember, it's a well-known verse that we've used often. It just shows again that it's not enough to be alive in the Garden of Eden. But we have to choose to eat of the tree of life if we're going to be justified in God's eyes. John 1 and 12. But to all who received him, you see, and received, not believed, but received. Belief is part of it, but receiving is the vital part. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. And then these who receive the spirit of Jesus are people who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, brothers and sisters, too many of us are trying to be born, you see, of the will of the flesh or of the will of man instead of of God. And God can only justify us in his own eyes when we actually receive this life. Why? Because it's the only thing that will make us like God. That's it. And the whole purpose God had in putting us here was not to allow us to live in peace for a few years, but to allow us to receive his supernatural, uncreated, inimitable life that makes us like himself in a miraculous way. And that's why we have to receive the life of the Holy Spirit because that's the only one, way, one who makes us like God. It's the only one who sanctifies us. Sanctification is called making you holy. Justification is treating you as if you are holy. God justifies us. He treats us as if we're holy. That is, he doesn't destroy us. We're alive here. He should really have destroyed us all because we're unholy. 
But he has left us to be alive. So he's treated us as holy. Now he wants us to receive the life of his Holy Spirit so that he can make us holy and sanctify us. And loved ones, it's the reason why many of us have difficulties with this second part of Romans, which for the next few years we'll find teaches us the whole effect that this supernatural life has in our day-to-day lives. The reason some of us who call ourselves Christians have trouble with this second part of Romans, the reason many of us who call ourselves Christians have trouble with the whole idea of sanctification, the reason many of us who call ourselves Christians have trouble with this business of being filled with the Holy Spirit is because we have never actually received the Holy Spirit. We have never actually been born of the Holy Spirit ourselves. We have entered into a mental kind of belief in justification, but we have never actually been justified in God's eyes through receiving the Holy Spirit into ourselves at the new birth. And so many of us, you see, have nothing inside us that makes us love God's will. What happens when you receive the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit makes your heart like God's. He really does. He gives you a heart that is like God's. So that you find you have a heart inside you that wants God's will. You have a heart inside you that is glad every time his law reveals something of yourself that is not like him. It's a heart that wants to go after God, that wants more and more of him. And so when you come to subjects like sanctification or crucifixion with Christ or being baptized with the Holy Spirit, that heart that has been changed by the Holy Spirit coming into you yearns after those things. And so really, initial sanctification takes place the moment you are really justified. You are justified in God's eyes the moment you do what he asked you to do. He said, look, I've offered my Holy Spirit to you. That physical life that you have isn't enough. It'll die out after 70 years. I've offered my Holy Spirit to you that will impart to you my mind, the spirituality of my mind, the blessedness of my emotions, and the liberty of my will that will impart to you a supernatural body that will enable you to live with me and the Trinity family forever. Now, will you receive that life? And the moment we go over and receive that life into ourselves, that moment we're justified in God's eyes. And we have a sense of peace with him. It doesn't matter how justified he is in forgiving us, how justified he is in making the tree available to us again, we are only justified when we eat of that tree. And brothers and sisters, do you see there's a vast difference between those two things? And that's why Paul asks that question, you remember, in Romans 5 and 2. Seems almost the same question all over again that he asked in the verse that we studied last week. So you can see how important he feels it is. Romans 5 and 2. He answers the previous question, you remember, how are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. Not at all. And then he asks this question. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Now sin, brothers and sisters, is rejecting the Holy Spirit. It's being independent of God, you see. And that's rejecting the Holy Spirit. It's resisting God. And Paul says, how can we who have stopped rejecting the Holy Spirit still live apart from the Holy Spirit? And you can't do it. It's impossible. In other words, Paul says, everyone who is justified is a person who has received the Holy Spirit. And once you've received the Holy Spirit, you can't continue to reject it. There's some logic in language, and you can't reject and receive at the same time. And if you've received the Holy Spirit, then you can't reject the Holy Spirit. If you've received the Holy Spirit to depend on him and lean on him, then you can't be living apart from him or independent of him. And really it's a contradiction to say that you can. And that's what Paul is saying. That sin is resistance to God's will and independence of his Spirit. And once a person has received the life of the Holy Spirit, that person begins to have a heart like God and begins to depend on God and finds himself living dependent on the Holy Spirit. In other words, living free from that sin of independence. Now, that's the kind of uh, truth that is stated in Romans 8 and 14, if you like to look at it. It states those two parts, in a sense, that whenever the Holy Spirit comes into you, He makes you like God. And that those are the only people really who are sons of God. Romans 8 and 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And that's really how you tell a son of God. 
You could believe all that I have said, you know, for months and for years. You could believe it all. You could understand it better than I understand it. But do you see, it's not believing at all that counts. It's receiving the life that has been made available. Believing that God is justified in offering you that life doesn't mean that you've received it. Believing that you are justified in being alive here on earth and not being destroyed by a flood does not mean that you've received that life. The heart of justification and the beginning of sanctification is receiving the life of the Holy Spirit. And that is what the new birth is. You see. That's why we talk about the new birth being believing that Jesus has died so that God could offer us the Holy Spirit and receiving that Holy Spirit. Many of us are trying to substitute intellectual assent and emotional regret for real believing and receiving. Many of us are trying to substitute believing and being sorry for repenting and actually receiving. Because to receive the Holy Spirit means you may have to make room for him. The Holy Spirit will not dwell with sarcasm. He will not dwell with a critical attitude. He will not dwell with a heart that is bent on making as much out of other people as you can. So when the Holy Spirit comes in, he demands that you deal with those other things that are not like him. That's why he's called the Holy Spirit. So really, brothers and sisters, to be born of God, or to be justified in God's eyes, we need to repent and receive the Holy Spirit. Now don't get all worked up, you see, over, do I mean by receiving the Holy Spirit being baptized with the... No, we haven't come to that at all. I'm just talking about becoming a Christian. Being justified in God's eyes means you repent. You stop doing the things that the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to do and you receive the Holy Spirit of the supernatural life of God into yourself. And that begins to make you like God and to sanctify you. Now, loved ones, I, I, I'd like to stop just now and just pause for a moment so that you really can ask a question and if the Holy Spirit doesn't want a question asked, then we can just have a moment of silence. I'm just so anxious, loved ones, that you'll see that the height of becoming a Christian is much higher than what we have imagined. And I'm anxious that you'll see it and that you'll know if you're a child of God or not and not be in any doubt about it, you see. Brother. So brother says, if living apart from the Holy Spirit is sin, does that mean when you receive the Holy Spirit, you will not sin anymore? And the answer is, if you will submit to the Holy Spirit, brother. If you will submit, if we will submit to the Holy Spirit and listen to his voice and listen to his promptings, there is no reason why we should sin in the sense that sin is conscious disobedience to God. Now, if you define sin as any a deviation from absolute right, then we'll sin. we sin day after day because we have imperfect minds and unbalanced emotions. But if you mean by sin, knowing conscious disobedience to God's will, no, that is right. If we will submit to the Holy Spirit once we receive him, we will walk into a life of victory. And you've hit it exactly, yeah? All right. All right. Brother says, isn't walking with the Holy Spirit then a lifetime thing? Yes, it is. Brother, what many of us have found, however, is that we learn to walk rebellious to the Holy Spirit or walking kind of beside Him early on in our Christian lives so that we ran a kind of compromised Christian life. And so many of us found that not only had we to start walking in the Holy Spirit, but we had to die and deal with a whole lot of that independence that we had bred within ourselves. And so that's why Paul talks of this crisis in Romans 6. Because so many of us, if we had, brother, that's right. If, if we would walk on after the Holy Spirit fully and freely, we would walk into victory. But many of us have sunk into compromised, self-controlled -control, uh, surrenders. And that's why we have troubles. Is 
That's good. Brother, I'd love to... S- if you could just raise your hand, then I could see you, But because I'd just like to look... Ah, yeah. No, they're the same, brother. Yeah? Seems to me the Holy Spirit... God said he would send the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, yeah? The problem, brother, is why I emphasize receiving the Spirit is so many people have talked about accepting Christ. And they don't mean to receive the Spirit of Jesus into themselves. They mean, I accept Christ, yeah? I accept Buddha. I accept that this world is spinning around in space. They accept the intellectual concept of Jesus. And that's, that's why it's so important to see, the ones, that it's not just accepting the idea. It's not just believing in the concept of justification. It is actually receiving the life of this man into us. And do you, want, do you see, that's why there seem to be two kinds of Christians. And you know it as well as you're sitting there. There seem to be Christians who know it all, believe all the right things, go to church, sing all the gospel hymns, but they're not like Jesus. They aren't like Jesus at all. There are other wee souls that don't know it all at all. But but they have received the spirit of Jesus into them. And there's a gentleness and a softness about them and a teachability about them that immediately makes you sense you're with brothers and sisters. It seems to me, sis, that many of us are in that position. If you're not sure you're a Christian, how do we go about receiving Jesus? I think many of us, when we listen and see a little deeper into God's word, we begin to wonder, yeah, just where am I? Brothers and sisters, it's as just a straight deal. You repent and receive. You ask the Holy Spirit to show you where have I been living apart from you. And give him time to answer. You know, he will. Don't, don't speak to him and then do a ventriloquist job, you know, and speak back to yourself and say, ah, oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, just, just speak to him, ask him. Don't put a deadline on him, you know. Don't, put, don't say, you must answer before I have breakfast. No, give... Ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, show me. I really want to know, where am I walking independent of you? Where have I started to walk just in the strength of my own mind or in my intellectual belief? Where have I become just an intellectual Christian, if there is such a thing? Where have I become just an intellectual believer? And the Holy Spirit will begin to show you. And he may show you the next day a little more. He may show you something in the Bible that will show a little more. But usually, many of us, when we at all open our, uh, our consciences to the Holy Spirit, a lot of things will flood in upon us that we know we're doing against God's will. Now, you repent of those dear ones. You stop doing them. Don't cry. Don't say you're sorry. Don't say, I'm going to try harder next time. Stop doing them. That's it. That's what you do to a man whom you've crucified. You don't say, keep pushing the sword in and say, I'm sorry, I'm doing it. You keep the sword out. You say, I stop this. And secondly, you receive the Holy, you receive the Spirit of Jesus by faith. You say, Lord Jesus, I've done what you asked me to do. I've stopped crucifying you in my life by stopping my sins. Now I receive you in. And stopping sins, loved ones, is an honest determination to stop them. You can only stop them today, you know. You can't stop them tomorrow. You can only say, Lord, as far as I'm concerned, I'm stopping those things now. All right. Can you actually stop doing the things by nature under our own power? You can set your... God can see your will. And he knows whether you're really willing to stop those things. And if you're really willing to stop those things, he gives you the grace to actually do it. You can be willing to stop them. And the Holy Spirit is able to tell whether you're willing or not. Loved ones, I ran that game with God for a long time. You know, I said, oh yeah, well, I'll repent. You know, I'll I'll repent. I'll say I'm sorry and I'll stop them. But really, he won't know. But I kind of think I might try it again later on. (laughs) And it was so stupid, you know, to think that that the infinite God could not see every thought that was in your mind. And so that's, it says, the Holy, in fact, that's the way to receive the Holy Spirit. Loved ones, God will only give the Holy Spirit at the new birth or a justification to those who have actually determined to have done with those things. And God can tell whether you're willing or not, you see. He can tell whether you really mean it or not. So that's it. Pastor, what if you, you know, you kind of want to, but then you, well, you kind of don't, and you do it. That's it, brother. That's the battle, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's it. That's it. That's the battle, you see. You, you kind of want to, you know, but somehow you don't. No, that's it. And brother, I think that's been the problem with a lot of us. 
We have in our, uh, now I'm talking, there are some of us here I think who have been humanists and agnostics for years and have never been involved in churches. But many of us have been involved in churches and have tried to seek God and tried to receive him. And I think that's the problem. Many of us have said, well, we on the whole want to have done with these things. On the whole, as a general rule, there are a few things that we'd like to negotiate with God about, but generally we'd like. And we try to receive the spirit of Jesus in on top of all this manure. And you can't do it. The Holy Spirit will not come in on top of a whole lot of sin. Yeah, brother. That's it. No, you have to fight your way through. Am I all the way with you, God? Or am I not? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Brother. I, I won't repeat the question because I think the, my answer will, will probably uh, restate it. It seems to me there's no question the Holy Spirit can only be received by a person who totally submits to him at that moment. There's no question of that. You know, There aren't Christians who receive the Holy Spirit without completely submitting to him and those who receive him completely submitting. It seems at the moment of justification, at the moment of the new birth, at the moment of the forgiveness of our sins, the moment we become Christians, not talking about baptism of the Holy Spirit at all, at the moment we become Christians, we must be totally submitted at that moment to the Holy Spirit. The problem, brother, is that there are some of us then who cease to be submissive to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit then witnesses that to our conscience. He witnesses that he's grieved then we sometimes ask forgiveness for it and we're back under him again. But sometimes we don't ask forgiveness and we don't yield to him. And so there are many children of God walking in various degrees of resistance to the Holy Spirit. And this is where you get what we call carnal Christians. People who were alive but now live a 